Um, we're glad to see all of you here again. It's our second Node.js Meetup edition in Wrocław. And it's a big pleasure for us to continue doing it. Today we have three talks. I'll start with the first one, and afterwards we'll carry on to other talks. And I won't waste your time. Let's begin. <coughs> Today we are going to talk about food. I hope you're not hungry. Otherwise, I want to say sorry for you. Um, we will start from harvesting, and um, you know it's coming from many years ago. Um, people were taking grains, planting them into the fields, gathering the plants, and gathering what they got afterwards, handle it somehow. Uh, mechanisms evolved over the time, and now you can do it more efficiently, but the basic mechanism is the same. Grains are the same all the time, and you shouldn't care much about sorting, because like, they are all grains, they are about the same quality, so you can use bigger and bigger machines, you can do it in complex, and it doesn't make a big problem for you to gather all those grains and handle all those grains. So you can easily extract whatever you want and make flour and bake bread. On the other hand, there are berries. If you ever lived on the north, you've probably been to the forest and tried to gather some berries in the forest and it's a terrible adventure, like you need to go into the swamp, you are, like you step onto elk's sheet and uh, it's, it's terrible. You couldn't automate it, you need to pick all those berries with your hands, there might be some small tools, but you couldn't totally automate it. So it hurts, it takes way more time to handle it, and well, it's not as pleasant job to do. So. It looks like this in reality, like oh, on the big screen it looks even more terrible than I expected. But again, like it's terrible adventure. So the difference between grains and berries that grains is kind of API. You have this information prepared for being gathered and you just send requests to get this information and it's already sorted, it's already in format you expect. And everything works kind of out of the box and you feel happy. You don't need to put much efforts in automation. Um, and to device, on the other hand, we have berries, where you have different sources of data you need to extract from different websites. It's usually different. Some of berries are rotten, as you can see, and you need to sort them. You need to pick exact berries you need and probably need folks several times to gather different kind of berries. So <clears throat> I want to start from the topic which isn't usually covered in such kind of presentations about web scrapping and um, there is a biggest obstacle you can find in your way and this obstacle is legal and before we will go further I want just to tell you that well some legal problems exist. As long as parsing and robust.txt is prohibited, it's illegal. At least in a couple jurisdictions of different countries, you couldn't do so. You can get a legal case, you can go to court and you lose this uh, case. And there are even several cases where uh, guys who created some applications had to pay big companies because they scrapped their data. Um, even though they might be prohibit you using web scrappers in their terms of service, uh, please raise your hands, guys, who reads terms of service of different websites before using them. Really? <laughs> wow. Um, and, well, as long as you're abusing the servers, it can be considered as web abuse and, and fire uh, use. So it's also not recommended to go this way. Um, and yes, like just intellectual property, which is used without... Um, notifying the source without getting the written permission to take it might be also a problem. So <clears throat> there is also like ethics stuff which isn't regulated by laws, but well, be reasonable with timeouts and threats. If you need to take this data or data once per like week, 
there is no reason to do it in the 10 minutes. You can do it like during one night and make everyone happy. You should, you can avoid abusing the servers. And in case the target website isn't supposed to handle big overwords, it will make them much happier. And um, let the website know that you are bots. You can specify user agents if you are doing some parsing. It's not a big deal. And most websites won't block you because of this. It's a big stereotype that you need to fake real user agents. Um, uh, sometimes, I will tell you the real example. You can agree with owners of the website that you're going to do some parsing. And you can agree on some time. For example, if there is some uh, electronic store which is located in some specific location, like media markets here, you can agree with them that you parse them at night between like 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. Uh, this time is like the lowest, um, <coughs> has the lowest overloads, so it's easy to parse this time and you won't affect anyone. Um, and be reasonable with scope. We will go into scope optimization technique and uh, we will talk how you can reduce amount of pages you need to parse for your website. So I, before I start, just to double check, uh, please. Avoid being an asshole. It's the only thing I'm, I want to ask you before we start. So, in the first, I want to ask you, like, um, how we can get the data. So, in the internet, everything comes to the fact that we send some request and we get some response from the server. And it might be uh, just receiving of some HTML page. Um, which you can just parse and you can take it with like any uh, technology which is suitable for it, like serial, fetch, request, whatever. There are dozens of libraries and tools you can use. Um, on the other hand, you can get into the situation when the website is single page application or you have some dynamic data on a page which uh, is going to appear after some actions user has conducted and you need to automate the sections, imitate them. And not always using their API is a good idea. We also go into this. So let's consider it as our agenda for today. Um, so on the step of fetching the data, what can we do on this particular step? Um, we, want, we can start from selective crawling. <coughs> what I want to talk about, for example, um, real example from my experience, uh, we were doing uh, web scrapping for the big electronic store in Ukraine and they had several suppliers um, which basically provide the same items for most shops in the country. So most shops of the country basically resell the same, same stuff from different suppliers. And those suppliers provide you the price list, like it's a big Excel spreadsheet and uh, you just extract some names of the products and some links to their websites and um, like the website of supplier, I mean, and you just crowd the data, like name of the product, attributes, which you use for filters, like this stuff when you want to pick a laptop, which has 16 gigabytes of memory or stuff like this. Um, descriptions, pictures, some of this information is very useful when you fill the store automatically. So um, it looks on the first glance that you need to parse everything, but uh, you can parse just some really required amount of data. You can fill the most popular items. You can extend it with time. And uh, in real life, you're still stuck in the fact that some descriptions need to be re rewritten. Some data couldn't be normalized in a good way. So doing it in batches might be more beneficial and you can save a big of throughput there. Uh, another point is URL prediction. If you have, again, for example, this store, probably you shouldn't iterate over the categories page and check in every product item. You can just check, is there any dependency in URLs, create some script which will go just iterate through IDs, for example, and scroll all the products you have in the store. Um, duplicate request prevention. It's a good idea to use databases where you can put the links you have already been to the date and time where you have been there the last time because some data needs to be updated more often than other data kinds of data. And well, smart scheduling, there are different libraries. We also touch this, how you can go into this. So <coughs> I picked the websites. Um, it looks like the most websites on the internet, I think. And uh, just imagine that we want to pick some data out of it. And well, what basically it looks like, 
we have some, I believe we have still table here, I don't, I don't think we have divs, and uh, we have some paragraphs and there is a link. So, for example, we want to go over this page and get all the pictures we have on this page. And in the first place, we need to get this HTML. And we did it in the first step, the step I mentioned before. And when we got this information, <coughs> we will iterate over the tree, um, DOM tree. But when you get the HTML page, what is the first step of making it as some structure and treat the data in its way. You need to extract picture, like pictures. The first and most often frequent mistake people do is using the rigor expressions. And there is a big math behind it. So there is a thread. Um, I'll share the presentation I will have a chance to read, where people who try to write some comprehensive parsers using rigor expressions spend significant time and failed and they explain why it doesn't work and why it is a bad idea to use rigor expression for it and <coughs> there is a difference into the languages and how they supposed to work and how they represent the data and if you want to get some data out of html it makes sense to build a synchronous oh, I'm sorry, abstract syntax tree uh, please raise your hands who know what abstract syntax tree is it's good. Um, I have an example to you, and um, I will demonstrate what it is. So the most obvious and uh, beneficial in long-term solution is to build um, a representation of HTML you have on your page. And um, for example, it's one of the libraries I'm using. It's called Pars5. And um, it's the base of many Pars and libraries you can find on the internet. And you can see that basically it creates some kind of JSON, and if you are using JavaScript library, it's going to be JSON. And it's just nested tree, which has information about nodes, like what is kind of tag HTML, name of the tag HTML. It has child, its body, and it has some also attributes. And well, there is some headings, um, and you can see that there might be also some attributes if we have some class name or styles. It will be it, it will appear here. So most of libraries uh, use such mechanism under the hood. Uh, implementation might be different, but logic is the same. And what's really cool that browsers also build such tree under the hood. And for example, React builds or Angular builds such tree under the hood. And you build such tree afterwards you render HTML. Afterwards you build this tree again, and afterwards you render the picture. But let's come back to the, our presentation. <coughs> so you build an abstract syntax tree. And now you want to go through it. For example, find some specific nodes. You want to extract some headings from the page pictures. And there are some libraries. Um, there is one library. It's called Cheerio. It really looks like jQuery. Um, it's a big pleasure for me to talk about jQuery in 2019. Um, there is JSDOM, uh, X-Ray, and uh, you can also go through abstract syntax tree manually. Um, I've seen such approach on the internet, but I couldn't get any reasonable idea where it's really beneficial and why should you try to create your own implementation instead of using, like mentioned above. And let's check what we've got. Because I'm talking too much and let's show, show talk about some code. So in the first place, um, I take in a website with news from Taiwan um, because Taiwan does stay neutral and to pick something what is really far away from us. Um, there is a link. Um, we won't iterate. We won't just open this website. Let's check how it looks. It's something like this. And let's come back to our parser. Our parser. Oh, just a second. <clears throat> and you can see that we have some structure of posts. And the structure repeats all the time. So we have some h5 tags. We have some rows. Basically, just bootstrap markup. And it's easy to extract data from it. So dependency is that we have h5 tags. We have links. And we also have some descriptions. So let's just take care of links. We won't make it complicated and we'll just extract links out of here. 
Uh, so we'll go into the, our snippets, and you can see that basically I have defined the link, and um, I will just fetch this data. Um, there is a library which is called request promise. It's just a wrapper around regular request library, and I just can use it with a sync await and avoid making it promise manually. And I will use the library I mentioned in the, on the slides, it's called Cheerio, to extract the data out of it. And so you can see this shiny and very familiar syntax from the uh, 10 years old. And it's come back, but you can see that I basically just go into headings, go uh, to links, make it an array and map over this array in order to extract text out of these links. So let's check how it works. Uh, I'm sorry, it's the first one. It's, it's zero. So yep, you can see that we have really interesting news in Taiwan. Um, well, way more interesting than we have here, but um, <coughs> let's make it a little bit more complicated. Fetching the data from um, one page isn't hard. What if you want to take page information from a couple of pages, if you want to iterate over the pages? We can check the link and we can notice that basically all the links are about the same. We have just different page ID here and if we'll put two here, for example, it means that we'll go to the second page of the news. So we can make it a little bit more complicated. We'll add a for loop where we'll just do absolutely the same magic, except the difference that we also fetch the URL to it. And we'll save uh, our results to JSON because we don't want to put it into the console. We will extract it to the file. So let's take a look. You can see it iterates over the pages. It is kind of slow because it's blocking operation. I'm using a sync await and it will wait until the uh, results of the first page in order to start parsing the second page. Uh, but we've got this results JSON and um, well, if we'll do something like this, we can get readable JSON and well, we've got what we wanted. So we have some um, results. Let's go further and uh, make it even more complicated. And let's add some DOA. For example, you want to scrap a big website and you don't really want to do it uh, instantly. You don't want to abuse the website. You can just put some DOAs. Um, I usually do something like this, for example. Um, to be less like a bot. But I mean, it doesn't really matter how you're going to use it, but we can add some DOA here and um, try to launch it again and we will see that it kind of works, it became slower and it phased between sending requests. So just using a sync await syntax, we can save significant amounts of code from being written. Um, and the last example, it's not about news in Taiwan, it's a little bit different example from what I personally do. For example, um, we have a website, which is a um, website of medical institution in USA and, USA, and they provide information about different medical conditions. And depending on uh, this kind of medical condition, um, I provide users information like what they can have, like I parse their DNA sequences and parse these databases, which I have medical databases, find relations and provide users info. So for me, it was important to gather some big list of diseases and um, we'll go and try to do something like we've done before, but for this medical institution website. Mm. It looks like this. 
Um, I think I, I need to copy the whole stuff here. Um, like there are pages with this list of medical conditions and we can grab them. Um, the difference is that we need to iterate over the letters. It can be easily done this way. We can uh, create strings out of the char codes and almost the same codes as we had before and let's try to execute it. Well, you can see that it goes over the letters. Unfortunately, now we won't wait for 26 pages because, like, why should we? And we'll parse only two pages in order to get our results. And here we go. Sorry. So we've got the list of titles, the list of pages. Afterwards, we can go iterate over the list of these HTMLs, grab the descriptions, and get the stuff done. Uh, probably you noticed that when I started doing this in the first place, we canceled the operation and we didn't receive anything in the end. And it's the reason why you need to extract data all the time while you're uh, parsing. For example, you have 50,000 pages, and you go page over the page. And on the page, 33,000, you get 500 error. You try to parse it, you get into the fact that element doesn't exist, you try to access some key, you get the error that you couldn't access the key of undefined, and you lost everything. So it's the reason why it makes sense to uh, save the data after each particular iteration here. Um, so <coughs> there are even easier ways to do so. There are libraries which help you to write less code. Um, here is just an example of the library, which is called X-Ray. If you don't have any complicated logic, if you don't want to go deep into the uh, <coughs> DOM structure, if you don't want to uh, build some complicated logic, you can specify that, okay, on this page, like Y Combinator, we can take all uh, elements with class post, and we want to extract an object uh, where title will be uh, what is located inside the uh, H1 tag, which is located inside this post element, and inside the A tag of this element. And we also want to take link, and with such annotation, we can specify that we want to parse attributes, not the uh, inner content of it. It automatically allows us to paginate. We can specify the pagination button. Um, where the link is located. We can specify limits. It means how many pages are supposed to be iterated. And we can write the results into JSON. So let me demonstrate how it works. It works this way. Uh, <laughs> yes, because basically we don't have an example zero here. Mm, so it finished, and you can see that we've got some results, and it is even formatted out of the box. So if you want to grab some simple data, it can be easily done without involving more uh, low-level instruments like Cheerio. So let's come back to our presentation. Um, Unfortunately, in real life, it's not that easy, so I want to give you some tips which I got during my experience with web parsing or just, I think, like six years with web scrapping. Um, it's so, so easy to write a shit code when you do parsers. Like, they are very simple, you write them fast, and that's why you forget what is written there very fast, and when you try to reuse and understand what you written yesterday, it becomes hard. So it makes sense to force yourself to write helpers and wrappers up front and build your parsing system on top of it. It uh, really makes sense to keep them granular and reusable because many helpers might be useful for you. Like I have my own library where I specify like, okay, there are methods how I can extract images and it will handle all requests to download image and get it. Um, uh, helpers which help me to download video and stuff like this. Um, 
And afterwards, you just build parsers out of these blocks, and it really rewarding and helps you. Um, spend time to make it fault tolerance. Um, as I mentioned before, it's very um, sad when you check in the morning um, your cool software you written yesterday and launched for a night, and it says so oh, there was some error, so I lost everything. So check all the data you receive, and even if you have and assumptions that data always looks the same, it, it might be not an option. There might be some exceptions, and it might be some advertisement block which looks a little bit different, but got the same kind of class or HTML structure, and it's just coincidence. The coincidence which can ruin the whole experience of web scrapping. Um, we even finished with very weird stuff. We started writing unit tests, well, not unit tests, but markup tests for other companies without notifying them that we are writing unit uh, markup tests for them just to check that, okay, their markup is still on the same, in the same format we expected it to have, so we can launch our scrapper and it will work. If some of these tests fails, well, it doesn't work. And just like regular libraries, like for example, Jest, are totally fine for running such tests and uh, it's so, so, so useful. Um, and keep logs. Like, if you made these fault store runs, um, it makes sense to have an access to information if you skipped any pages and if you are missing some information in your database, especially if you are a big, for example, as I mentioned the story, big store and you have hundreds of thousands entries, um, it's really easy to miss that you are missing some entry in your shop and users couldn't just purchase it. And it's okay if it's like some kind of mouse which nobody will purchase like or and you are using like two or three users. But just imagine you missed an iPhone by mistake. Um, um, for example, <coughs> uh, there are other cases. Uh, first is keep the reference to the data easily accessible. Uh, have some database where you can check have you parsed this page before, have you stored some information from this page before, probably some pictures you don't want to parse again and download and load your traffic, spend your server time, spend remote server, spend server time. Um, permanently eject parsing results, it's something that I mentioned before, be reasonable. Um, I've seen an approach when people try to build some complicated ecosystem just to be a cool guy, uh, leverage some Amazon just to parse a couple of pages, but well, RAM is cheap, like you can use any VPS, and if you can just do something, some calculations in RAM sometimes are just easier and um, in terms of time, because like in real world, time is usually more expensive than some really hard optimizations. Um, about images, if you don't know about images, sometimes they are located under different references, but still they are quite equal and basically are duplicates. So I suggest trying to store image hash sums and when you don't know what image, you can check, okay, it has the same hash as an other image I have in my database. So I just put the reference to existing images instead of storing another one. It can save your storage like gigabytes of storage. Um, another stuff is about retaining the data. You don't know how to use it. For example, you are working again on the store and you want to extract only titles and attributes. You don't want to get description because like, it's still not unique and it won't uh, reward you in um, search results of search engines and you think like, okay, I'll still carry on and write my own descriptions for item I want to sell most. But afterwards you realize that, okay, there are some words, keywords in our descriptions. And if I'll go iterate over these keywords with some algorithm, I can extract some additional information I can put on my website. And you realize that, oh no, I didn't parse descriptions, so I need to launch all this stuff again, go over each page again, and now finally get descriptions. So. I really recommend you getting all the data you can find on a page, even if you don't know how to use it now, because it can become really useful afterwards. Um, file system is fast, but if you want to update the data online after each iteration, database can really 
improve your experience. Um, dynamic contents, <coughs> it, all the stuff I mentioned before, it's easy when you are trying to work with static HTMLs, but big parts of the contemporary web isn't static anymore. You have the single page applications, which are fetching data from APIs. And the most obvious solution is to use their API, like they already exposed API, so why shouldn't I use API instead of parsing it? Um, but sometimes at time it hurts because this API usually doesn't have any specification because like, why should you, should they share a specification with you? Um, sometimes it's just cards. You need to fetch information from 10 different endpoints to fulfill one dashboard you want to parse and you want to find some shorter solution. In this case, you can emulate the user and there are some libraries how you can emulate the user behavior and there is a library which is called Puppeteer. I really like it, and I use it for web scrapping, for uh, <coughs> integration testing for uh, our project, and I think um, I will convince you to try it also. Um, I'm sorry. The stuff should be broken. Mm. Oh, okay. <coughs> I wanted to fix the example before we start, and I made a duplicated variable. So you can see that I launched the script. It opens an Instagram of National Geographic, to clicks on the first link on this page. And uh, under the hood, it launches the script, which iterates over the HTML we've got uh, <coughs> after opening this page. And you can see that, well, we already have the link of this picture. Um, it is the first link in data sets. I did it to make the example simpler. But if I open it, we can see that, well, it's the same picture. And the problem why we should use Puppeteer is that if we we'll try to open the same stuff without JavaScript, like I installed Firefox and disabled JavaScript on it just for sake of this demonstration, you can see that, yep, it doesn't really work, and um, we need to enable JavaScript, fetch data from APIs, and there is no fallback for it for browsers without JavaScript. So, yep, we've got this page, picture. It's pretty much the same what we wanted to get, like this one, just smaller one. Um, it's happening because Instagram uses the mechanism of <clears throat> set of sources for different resolutions. You can see that, well, they have like one link for small screens, bigger screen, bigger, bigger. And I just picked the first one. I made, I split this string by spaces and taken the first part of this array. And it looks also quite simple. You can see that, well, we just launched Puppeteer. It can be launched headless. Um, and it works perfectly. I disabled it just for sake of this presentation. You can specify um, which screen resolution you want to have. Um, you can make screenshots. You can click buttons. You can scroll over the page. You can emulate user scroll as just scrolling permanently with different timeouts. You can move mouse, and um, it's really nice if you want to pretend being a real user. Uh, so this stuff can be also easily automated with Puppeteer. I won't go deep into details because we're limited in time, but it's really cool instruments, which I encourage you to give a try. Um, and the last problem, uh, when you get the data, it usually is in different formats, especially if you fetch data from different sources. It can be in different not just formats, but it can be written differently. For example, you have laptops and you parse attributes for RAM. And it might be just eight. It might be eight GB. It might be eight gigabytes. Gigabytes might be from capital or from lowercase letter. There might be space, there might not be space because their content manager forgot to add some space after the number. Um, there might be some mistakes. Um, if you want to use filters, sometimes you want to group some options. And 
in some other cases, there might be some, for example, numbers like 1.25, 1.35, and you want to unite them into group like one, uh, up to, from one up to two. So in such cases, you need to normalize data. And when we like, when our data looks the same, we all like such pictures, when everything is perfect, but, 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 but reality is this, and our data looks like this. And it's not the case sometimes, it's always the case. And you have a bunch of different stuff which looks cool separately, but it's totally not incompatible between each other, so you need to normalize. And as I mentioned, the data is dirty, taken from multiple sources. It's sometimes submitted by customers. It, like, when customers can submit some information, you want to parse, it's like real hell on the earth. Um, and complex data, which can be simplified, like it's in good format, but you don't want to store such complex data. You want to extract some small piece of this data. So which steps can you try? First one is stream and lowercase data because when it's streamed and overcase, it's easier to compare and sometimes you can find some duplicates and avoid different solutions just because of um, case. Remove noise symbols with regular expressions like new line symbols, uh, measures and stuff like this. Sometimes it's use useless and it's better to edit after you format data and extract it exact values. Um, so, also, noise data, like if you have amounts of RAM, probably you don't need measures at all. You can remove all kinds of gigabytes and stuff like this and add it on your own. Um, <coughs> mark some data sets as a reference and um, use similarity algorithms. And it's something that helps me really with medical project because um, there are a million ways how you can uh, specify some disease. Uh, it might be like some shortening inversion. It might be big version. It might be big and shortening inversion together. It might be in braces or without braces. It might be some alternative uh, name. It might be um, many different things. And what you can do is find some data sets of diseases like you want to use as a reference. Like, okay, this one is good. There are no repeats. I cleaned it on my own. And I want all my data to look like data in this data set. And there are some algorithms you can use for it, and we will focus on it right now. You can also use machine learning, but um, I'm not really good in it, so I won't really talk about machine learning here. And we will focus on similarity algorithms, because they do their job perfectly. There are different algorithms. Um, you shouldn't really know, I just added them for general education. Um, there are two of them, and for my tasks, they provide about the similar results and the similar performance. Um, I stick to the library which is called String Similarity because I just like it a little bit more from syntax perspective, from how easy it is to use for my case, but they are quite the same and they're quite flexible. And um, let me show you some short demonstration. Um, um, I made several examples. I think we are limited in time, so I will show you um, it quite quickly. And we have those JavaScript files. Um, that we have some medical conditions. It's just the list we extracted in the example before when we were trying Cheerio. And you can see that, well, <coughs> here are some names. And we'll focus on these names and consider them that they are the reference. And we also have some value which we want to check in this reference. Which, what is the closest? And it's example of real data I have in my application, for example, and I want to put more reasonable description for this uh, particular disease. So, you can see that I added uh, specified, okay, there is Alzheimer's and it found, okay, it's Alzheimer's disease. It might be written a little bit differently, there might be different ending, but such algorithms allow you to extract and find the closest data and specify so I can put into my database instead of this one, which I parsed from the internet, 
I can just get this one because it's reasonable and it's something what I'm looking for and just replace this one with this one and all the diseases are going to be the same. Um, there is some problem that uh, you need also to adapt this data. For example, there is some heart disease. Um, and you can see that, well, it's a little bit like <coughs> confusing because I wanted to find heart disease, but I'll tell, you, tell my customer that he has warm, worms in his stomach. And uh, it's not something what we are looking for. And there are some small optimizations you can do to avoid such situations. You can um, lower case the data and get rid of stuff you don't need. So like here we had it. Um, sorry, I think like, yep. <clears throat> so we can uh, remove like this increased risk, like we can take it with some small conditions extracted from string and remove and we can look for this one and if we'll try to launch like this one um, you can see that okay we finally got heart disease and it's a little bit better than worms in the stomach so more more reasonable for us so pre data preparation makes a big difference in terms of quality and if you are creative enough you can <coughs> get things done. So some tips also regarding the data normalization. Why like strings proximity is calculated, <coughs> calculation is very expensive. If you have big strings and big database, it takes ages to compare. I sp uh, spent a couple of nights debugging it to make it uh, finish during one night uh, for a couple of data sets with 100 thousands to hundred thousands calculation. Uh, shortening strings increases uh, speed dramatically, so try to make strings as short as possible. Um, identify common differences if you see that there is some pattern and some word which happen, uh, happens to see quite often, you can check it just with if condition before doing such complicated calculations and it will be much faster. Filter them out and check on the stuff you couldn't identify with simple conditions. Um, think of file formats and database normalization. One of common mistakes when people try to write uh, files into file system in JSON, like I did on examples, it's a really bad idea because JSON is much harder and if you want to store some data on the disk and you want to keep it as effective as possible, it's better to use some kind of uh, CSV or stuff like this because it's, it takes much easier much smaller space on your hard drive and of course normalized databases and go for mutability when you work with data structures i know it's good to go with such immutable stuff but just imagine you have like one array which is like 500 megabytes in your ram and you do some map on it and now you have two arrays in ram which are 500 megabytes and uh, it's easy to get into JavaScript out of heap memory exception. It exists. Um, so take care. Um, so also, uh, if you are sti still need to use some immutability, just take care that you erase previous variable, then garbage collector can take care of data you don't use anymore. Um, go f for transducers. Uh, like Just remember the such uh, sequences will iterate your array three times instead of only one. So you can write some kind of transducer. I'll add a cool topic which explains how transistors work into uh, the references. Use schedulers, as I mentioned before, like splitting operation in several might be really beneficial and be creative. So references are going to be available when I share the presentation. It will be posted in our meetup group and thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Sure. Okay. Um, I think I was lucky enough to use it on multiple uh, commercial projects since 2013. 
And um, the first one, the biggest one, was the big internet uh, platform which sells goods, mostly electronics, but not just portable devices, but you can also buy like, you know, stuff like dishwasher and microwave in there, so they had quite a big list of items and they get data from uh, their suppliers and their website. They also fetch images from special API which provides them information about these images. Recently, they started using Google Vision API to provide information about attributes and automatically categorize it items because categorization is also a big pain. Um, so it's the real case. Also, there are product projects which allow you to follow uh, different websites and check is there any good offers. I know, for example, there is a nice resource in Poland which monitors uh, Allegro and if you want to purchase something, you just put the name of the item and the price threshold, when it is cheaper than this threshold, it will notify you. So it's also the project which is based around the Allegro and I'm pretty sure they have some agreement otherwise it's really easy to sue such server service. Um, I also work on medical research and I take a lot of medical data and they have quite simple and um, reasonable rules regarding the parsing. So they have different kinds of licensing and if you are using it for non-profitable organizations, you use it for free. If you are trying to make money out of it, you just pay some money and you can use it also. So many services are actually interested in uh, collaboration and integration with other platforms. Because, for example, this tool for Allegro, in the end, it increases the amount of items which were purchased in Allegro. So they have indirect benefit out of it. And if we will even dig a little bit deeper, uh, platforms like, for example, Google, Yahoo, and stuff like this, they are totally built around web scrapping. And people spend efforts in order to tell Google bot, please come and make indexing for me because I, I want it very much. So it makes um, a big difference what, want, what do you want to do and did you agree it in advance. Usually um, platforms go and talk about it and until you are trying to do something really rude, for example if you want to steal articles from some newspaper and pretend those articles are your articles, uh, or you want to parse some data, display it on your website and prevent user from going to the site of origin where he will not see the advertisements and won't generate money for the source of the information. In this case, I think they'll be unhappy and they'll make legal action. Otherwise, it's still discussable and um, it really depends on the country. It's really gray zone and there is no answer what can company, for example, in USA do to you when you are located in Poland and do the scrapping of this company when you are in Poland? So it's a gray zone. There are not much accidents and cases where such international situations were solved. But when you are inside the country, there were legal cases, there were big fines, and there were companies which had to close. Anyone else? Do you have to use scraping a check for the number of products changed? It's a good uh, thing to do. In our case, we had a big spreadsheet with the list of items they have on their website. And we were checking with our database line by line. Okay, we have this number, this number, and this number in our database. But those 20,000 items seems to be new. So we will scrap them and put on our website. Um, because scrapping whole database in one run was very hard. It was prohibited to do such big batches. And when we had to parse descriptions, um, we got in a big trouble because we had to spend a couple of days to scrap all descriptions and do such patches from different machines. And uh, we paid for two API keys to do it fast because it was really important for the business. So um, yes, optimizing uh, amount of requests is, is a must. So you need to be as much creative as you can and it rewards. 
Any more questions? Okay, <clears throat> I think I've been a little bit longer than I expected. Sorry for this. Um, we'll have five minutes break, and uh, we'll go for the next call for the next talk. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Cesar Dynak and I'll be talking about uh, embedded Node.js. So Node.js on embedded platforms and we could uh, discuss and think about whether it's something uh, fancy or something that is ready for production use. And yeah, so I'm Cesar Dynak. Uh, I was studying close to this place, the Wrocław University of Technology. Really good memories. And right now I'm working for some um, companies, uh, IoT companies, uh, but basically I don't know who I should put here in my occupation, so I'm just putting the name of my own company there, yeah. Can, uh, and you can also find me in some places, not in Facebook, but in some other interesting place like GitHub, GitLab, Last.fm if you remember, this kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so the plan of this presentation is, uh, as it was posted on the uh, Meetup page, it's also everything is available uh, for the GitLab pages, so you can also check it out, make a pull request, <laughs> uh, whatever, it's uh, live, and we'll go through the definition of embedded systems, so why I'm taking care about, about this, about putting Node.js on embedded, and finally, how we could properly deploy Node.js on the balance systems, what we can do with it, and some conclusions at the end. Uh, so, what's an embedded system? Yeah, so, you can go to Wikipedia and find your some definition, which uh, possibly is not the perfect one. I, one I will just show you my, my view on it. So what's an embedded system? And I'm uh, thinking about it more from the software, so from the operating system perspective. And uh, let's just uh, try to go into the uh, embedded systems, let's say, for, from, the, from the sky. So basically, I'm working with Linux, and let's say, on, I believe that we can deploy Linux currently on almost all devices, so uh, let's say we have some supercomputers, we can put our operating system on supercomputers, I know whenever you heard about it, but uh, currently uh, Linux is uh, running the 100% uh, of top uh, 500 supercomputers It's since last year, so basically the all of the uh, supercomputers are occupied by Linux. It has changed rapidly, but from the Unix, so it's basically the same family of systems. Um, yeah, in the cloud, so let's say go from the stars to somewhere closer to the ground. So then we have also, we can have some kind of operating systems. It's the uh, layer, let's say, lower than the supercomputers. On the desktop we have, well, we, we still don't have the year of the Linux on the desktop. It will possibly never appear, but uh, okay, we're going down, down, and yeah, it's it was always like uh, like this. Uh, Apple stayed still. Uh, we have also some mobile devices, which also could be considered as uh, uh, embedded devices, but that's a different market. The development of the mobile platforms look quite 
different? Well, basically, uh, Android is uh, is the king here, and it's something, let's say, different from the other Linux distributions that we have in other places. And yeah, right now we are into uh, embedded world. Uh, there, also Linux is very popular. Uh, but there are also some just bare, uh, bare metal uh, deployments, bare metal systems, the real-time operating systems. I found on the definitions, for example, on Wikipedia, they say that the uh, if you want to have the embedded system, it must be a real-time operating system on it. I would say that it's not true. So well, but what what's the what's the embedded system? How to how to specify it? Maybe I will ask. Uh, some of you, do you? Uh, who knows this kind of device? You know what it is? Like this, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. It's a Raspberry Pi. I believe it's right now as famous as the Beatles or Jesus or whatever. So everybody knows that. Uh, it's an embedded system, yeah? So it could be an um, uh, example for this. Uh, uh, Definition. Well, basically, uh, as I said, we could have some super super computers. We could have some servers, whatever workstations, and let's say that the um, embedded systems are the smallest devices, smallest systems, and they are uh, have uh, let's say they have a purpose, single purpose for what they should do, and that's that's how I understand it. That's how. Uh, it's also being uh, understood in the market, and it's also very nice that they are quite affordable because before Raspberry Pi, those uh, platforms for uh, development of embedded systems were quite, uh, let's say, expensive. And right now, uh, everybody could uh, afford it and just play by their own. And by the way, who have uh, played something, make some stuff and experiments on the Raspberry Pi? Is it? Yes, yeah, also half of you, so you know, it's fun, yeah. Um, and yeah, for also most of the people, it starts with Raspberry Pi, but there is also a couple of uh, other boards which you can start playing with. This is just one that's the most famous. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. I also make some comparison of those of those boards to think which is the best one from my from my perspective. I would say that they are quite. Uh, Currently, they are very uh, comparable to the computers that were on the market, I don't know, like 10 years ago. So you can basically, currently on the embedded devices, you can do everything you what you uh, could make on the desktops like 10 years ago or whatever. Yeah. So it could be treated not, it could be really used as a normal desktop device, just connect the power, connect the uh, HDMI display and just work on like on some workstation. And yes, yeah, so it's, uh, of course, it could be made for, uh, just for fun, because, well, I make some funny projects on Raspberry Pi, wow, uh, that's a hype, uh, but it could be also used for uh, learning, and uh, basically for learning, for promotions, so a lot of uh, companies are participating in creating those embedded systems, because it will make their microcontrollers more popular. For example, right now, I believe that the... Uh, yeah, I don't uh, I don't like this uh, microcontroller for Raspberry Pi uh, that much because it's from Broadcom, so it, we could say that it's being uh, somebody take the microcontroller out of the router and pl put it here and have some, let's say, uh, constraints. So it's not that nice, but I believe that really to put this Broadcom microcontroller here, it really increased their I don't know sales in terms of microcontrollers. So also, for example. Uh, Texas Instruments make the bigger board and so on. So when the company is cooperating with the uh, creators of those embedded systems, they also educate the developers to use it, and that's that's nice. And uh, okay, but that's still the first phase to uh, learn this microcontroller, and then you can also make some prototypes. So how is it working on real life uh, when you would like to uh, create some really shiny new product and really sell it in the market in the media market, whatever. Uh, first, don't want like you don't like to waste your effort on developing your own uh, PCB board from scratch. You just get some uh, device, just get the prototype, some board that's maybe larger that you would like it to be. But it's something which you can start off, make a POC proof concept for that. And uh, yeah, and 
how it how it works in general i believe if any one of you have played with raspberry pi of any other of those embedded devices you just uh, get the image that was already uh, available at the um, official page of this platform so raspberry pi or BeagleBone or whatever so well that's nice because it works out of the box it uh, it's really easy to prototype but uh, in the real life use cases in the production and so on uh, people are not downloading the prepared distributions of Linux of operating system, but they are creating their own uh, distributions. And yeah, it could just look like look like that. You could just download the latest image of Raspberry Pi specially prepared system and deploy it here. And well, we can also type apt get install Node.js enter and yeah, we're done. So. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That could be all. We have no JS on the build platform, and that could be that uh, that easy. But really, it's not. Uh, it shouldn't look that way if you'd like to sell a product in the market, because it's really a lot of overhead. The system is uh, not that much optimized. It has a lot of stuff that you don't would like to have, because well, you just need to have the Node.js on the build system. So why should you take care about all of this uh, desktop environment and stuff like that so you can use the embedded linux build systems to put your um, to put your system just really that will be really covering your your needs but what to this we'll talk about it uh, we'll talk about it also so uh, it's just let's say a set of tools to create your own system so as you are downloading the i know operating system on your computer for example the Ubuntu, Fedora, whatever, you're just downloading the distribution, the system that is prepared for your uh, architecture, for your computer, and just everything uh, Everything is uh, really uh, specified for how, how it should work on your device. But for example, you could have, uh, you would like to deploy the same software on uh, different platforms. So you would like rather to create your own meta distribution, you would like to create your own distribution that fits your needs and could be also adjusted to uh, different kinds of hardware. That's, from my perspective, also the most important difference between, say, normal computers, desktop and so on and embedded platforms, because they are not based on the Intel uh, X86 uh, standard. Yeah, they mostly have the ARM architecture and the ARM microcontrollers are really different between uh, themselves. Yeah, so that's how we you should use this, not just download the Debian or Ubuntu, but just create your own system that could be deployed. And yeah, it could have, uh, um, it just have this kind of uh, structure that uh, um, you have the source code of your, um, of your builder, yeah, you need to first build your uh, build some compilers on your local device and then you can uh, prepare it your your server to uh, build things for the um, for your target platform yeah so for example for this raspberry pi or something for on the uh, on the production yeah and uh, yeah so we have uh, several tools for doing that so to create your systems i believe that's still the most uh famous are the build root and the octoplot project at least they are ones that are the most uh, used on the market right now currently uh open wrt is known as a more known like a distribution for routers and it uh, has a lot of uh functionalities especially for routers uh, but those two are most common used in the in the market by the companies. For example, in Vrotsov it's very popular because uh, Nokia is using Yocto a lot, and this is some some just minor uh, minor popularity or, or already passed by. I just make some comparison out of them. So most of them are licensed by GPL version version two. That's standard for open source tools in uh, in general. There are also some others, but uh, really. You shouldn't care about that. Yeah, here is the popularity of those embedded Linux build systems. As you see, the build root is quite stable from a long time, and right now the uh, Yocto project is uh, on the rise, let's say, uh, as well as the Leda, which was part of the 
WRT, uh, which was the fork of this WRT. And I don't put the WRT here because it's being really um, is being searched really often because it's not being treated as an embedded Linux build system, but just as a distribution. So just people would like to, hey, uh, go to the Ompel and WRT page, download your system, and uh, make it work. Yeah. Okay, but why? Why I'm taking care about the embedded systems? Why I would like to put the Node.js embedded systems? Okay, well, we can. We have the. Uh, we are using the um, JavaScript uh, on our websites, yeah, because it just runs the web, it runs the front end. Okay, we are just using the uh, Node.js on our servers, so in, in the cloud and so on, and then we are building our service on top of it. But why we would like to run it also on embedded platforms? What's, what's my purpose about it? I would say that the big idea, at least from my perspective, is about like edge computing, which is a new trend that is uh, uh, coming here right now, and how I understand it. Well, you could also say that it's just, uh, it's just a buzzword, you know, there is an IoT, and there is a cloud, and edge computing is just a new, new buzzword, yeah, that is, uh, that we are need to live, uh, live with, so, oh, well, fine, yeah, it's just a buzzword, you know, we don't know anything, but we could also call the voice over IP uh, buzzword. Well, it means nothing, but once I met the guy who is the head of the VoIP department, I mean, okay, it, it could it could mean something. So uh, the edge computing trend is about to, I would say, move the uh, code execution from the cloud closer to client, because what's the really, really big problem that uh, some companies have, at least the companies that I'm working for, is that Okay, we have the approach right now that we are building some um, really small, cheap devices for the customers, so-called, I don't know, LAN cards, gateways, whatever. So uh, we are creating the, um, for example, we create some really cheap embedded device with really simple Linux on this. It just collects some data and send it to the, to the cloud. And there in the cloud, because it's really hard to update those devices, you know, it's, people need to download uh, software then and in the cloud you can make the you know live updates or all of your services easily so please just just uh, managers I know people think let's just make the embedded devices as cheap as possible and move everything to the cloud and right now we could say that okay so a lot of functionality is being moved to the cloud and well who pays for all those computations so basically the companies are paying for those computations because uh, they need to uh, you know pay for the I know Microsoft Azure or AWS servers or, for example, I know uh, OVH or the, I know any other kind of uh, kind of cloud. So that's the problem right now that a lot of computation is happening in the in the cloud. And for example, yeah, we could have the in the cloud we could have the uh, some, um, for example, Node.js services that are making all this job and we need to maintain it. So well, maybe if we'll just write this code once that it works. In the, mm, in the cloud, maybe it could be possible as we have stronger and stronger embedded devices that are really powerful and could uh, have a lot of computation power. Maybe we can even use the same code, not even the same algorithm, but maybe we could just uh, run the same code that we are running in the cloud and we are paying for them. Maybe customers should pay for it, yeah? Because he can buy an mm, expensive device and it could consume his uh, power, yeah? It could uh, be, uh, he could, should, could pay bills for it, yeah? So just to shift the uh, computation closer to the source of data, yeah? That's at least how I understand it. I hope it will not just be a buzzword, but it will be a great idea to move the um, data source more to the customer because also then customer is the owner of his uh, of his data yeah right now because i remember a situation when there was some promotion from the tauron i don't know it's one of the uh, biggest energy provider in poland and i just get some uh, device some smart plug that i could power I, I just connect to the ac and connect some device to it and it will like i don't know reduce my cost, whatever, I could just uh, turn something on and off. And they said, okay, but it was just a preview. Right now we are uh, shooting down the cloud and your device will not work. So that's, that's not nice, yeah? 
And uh, yeah, so that's that's why I'm. Uh, I think it's really. Uh, I think it's really interesting to because it's also we could have a possibility like this when we are thinking about you know enterprise architecture and so on. We could have some really cheap embedded devices and really have only the simplest services on them. No, not JS, even no Linux, just a pure bare metal uh, C or C++ code on them. And we could make a lot of those computations, for example, on our Node.js services in the cloud, but we can produce the more expensive uh, devices and put the Linux operating system with the Node.js there and even use the same code that we have in our services. Okay, so how to uh, deploy Node.js on those um, on the embedded Linux uh, right now, so on the embedded devices. Uh, well, as, as I said, just you know, download the custom software and type apt get install Node.js. Well, in prototyping it's nice, but it's it's not how it's done the, in the production. So yeah, how to deploy it. Um, well, I basically, it's really, it's the best approach uh, to start working with the operating system uh, to building your own operating system that you'd like to put on your uh, embedded device is to um, run computations on some really strong uh, computer. So just to, um, I don't know, some dedicated server and what's most important that it should have the very fast, you know, hard disk, uh, some SSD or even, I don't know, uh, the fastest uh, as it is possible, because really building an operating system, you know, it could take uh, gigabytes of, of, uh, of space and will, you know, take a lot of uh, operations, as you know, if you are compiling any big projects in C++ or whatever. Uh, so uh, it is uh, rather uh, recommended to run it on the as closest to hardware as it is possible, so just on your own very good machine or some very good server. But as uh, previously, I like to work with some cheap workstations. I just uh, I'm just using like to use the uh, virtual machines because I was making also making some research about that. So I was comparing those embedded Linux build systems between uh, each other, and I would like to have some really uh, repeatable uh, results and I just would like for example to run my experiments for I don't know uh, so for a couple of hours and then just shut it down so it's really nice just to don't buy a very very expensive machine and keep them uh, on my own but just to rent some virtual machine for only a limited, a limited time so uh, I really like to um, work on the oh, I would like to work on the um, OVH cloud, or how should I uh, pronounce it, because it provides very nice uh, OpenStack uh, interface. Of course, we could have the, we could just use the, uh, we could just use the um, command line tools here, as well as we could just use the uh, some shiny. Uh, graphical interface and create this new, create this new machine. Uh, so yeah, as we still have, uh, still have some time, and I will just try to uh, show you how we can, um, how we can make it work. Yeah, maybe let's be, uh, let's be cool and let's use the command line. So yeah. Oh, I have this tool. That's nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so let's just... Uh, Download the configuration file from here because if we don't like to pass the password, we need to download the configuration file. Yeah, okay, we have it here. Okay, so let's source it. Uh, 
Okay, you would like me to do this? So no, no, no. I, I wouldn't like to waste time here. Let's just launch it. Uh, uh, let's just launch it here. We need to make sure that we have the proper uh, keeper. Uh, okay, maybe let's create a new keeper because it's really nice to uh, 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 Linux 2019. Let's call it like that. Um, uh oh, let's not do like this. Check it out. This is the ah, okay. Public. Okay. <laughs> um, is it the same? Uh, yeah, it's the same. Okay, so let's look. That's that's the correct one. <laughs> Uh, okay, so let's create some nice uh, cloud uh, instance here. Just the uh, yeah. Let's just use the mm, 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 just choose a flavor for it. So let's just make it really something really nice and uh, strong so c to uh, 30. uh-huh yeah it should be nice oops mm -hmm. oh, okay yes debian 9 and uh, choose a choose a key pair. So this one should work. And yeah, that's all. So basically, right now I have quite powerful machine uh, so that I could uh, run all those uh, computations on my own. But if you would like to uh, play, if you just would like to try and Mm, you don't like to, I know, uh, buy some very strong machine because really, if you have, uh, mm, if you have not enough, uh, not enough RAM, if you have some weak CPU, uh, if you have like slow disk, it could really take hours. It really could even longer than one day if you have very very poor configuration and very very high expectations. Yeah, so. <laughs> So uh, that's why I recommend that way. Well, this seems to be running. And uh, yeah, we could try to log in here. Oh, we're there. That's nice. Uh, so yeah, if also if anybody is using Windows, it's also just nice to create something in the cloud and uh, don't take care to installing some Sigwin crazy things. Um, yeah, so we have the mm, we have uh, we have our virtual machine created, and let's just use the build root. As I said, the most popular one is uh, Yocto project, but it's uh, quite complicated. It's really very nice for the enterprise if you have a lot of different systems layers and your custom software or customer boards but if you just would like to start and make some operating system for your i know just start to work with your uh, raspberry pi or some first iterations of your new hardware or your company is not that big and you don't would like to have separate yocto project engineers let's use builders because it's just simpler yeah and yeah so we're making it totally from scratch. You see, we have just installed the new, uh, we just created the new machine with just some normal Debian. Uh, yeah, we also need to install some dependencies because, well, uh, what, is, what is Linux? You know, Linux is just some C code, yeah, that we need to compile, so it's as simple as that, yeah? Um, 
but also uh, when we'll be building some other uh, some other tools and we will not only create the Linux kernel that will run our device, we also create some uh, root file system and, oh, why well, it's not that nice. We'll just, um, we also need to create some other, some other stuff. We need to create not only, you know, not the, oh, not that shortcut. We, uh, we also want to create not just the Linux system, but the no Linux system, and that's the that's the difference. I hope you know. In, who knows the difference between Linux and GNU Linux? Not that much. How could you explain it? Let's say, what's the difference there? I think that there is no such thing as Linux kernel because Linux is only kernel, and GNU Linux also includes the graphical GUI packages from GNU project. Yeah, more uh, command line uh, tools. That's basically the most important because uh, you could just uh, run the Linux kernel and, for example, run one program on it and it could be said that it's an operating system, but basically uh, it's really, you cannot do much with only Linux kernel. It's just booting up the system and that's all, yeah? We just need to also have some other, other tools that are written in different, not only in C, but also in C++. Yeah, so installing those uh, dependencies, which are the, the most basic one. And uh, yeah. So we just get the uh, mm, build root sources, so the sources of this embedded Linux build system, the distribution creator, distribution maker. And uh, it's just a version from the from previous year. Just unpack it because it's everything uh, as simple in one uh, in one archive. Okay, I could, maybe I shouldn't copy that, but okay. And uh, right now uh, we'll use uh, we'll use a tool that it's called. Uh, Mini config. It's the CLI interface for con uh, configuring those embedded Linux build systems. I know, and how much of you have built your own Linux kernel from scratch? How much of you have compiled your own Linux kernel? Oh, also, huh? Excuse me? Yes, of course. Yeah, building gentle. You know, just compiling. It's a lot of a lot of fun and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, a lot of pain also could be. Uh, and the, those uh, embedded Linux build systems, they are quite similar to... Uh, configuration of those embedded Linux build systems is quite similar to configuring the Linux kernel because they both uh, dealing with the hardware. They are both using the really nice tool that was introduced, uh, I don't know, a few years ago, the device tree. So just a uh, file that configures the, tell you about the configuration of the hardware. And they also sharing this uh, nice uh, uh, many config view. So yeah, right now we are here. We are configuring the, uh, we are configuring the system that we would like to create. And, uh, but that's also the problem that we need to, uh, have some pre-configuration for our platform, so that's really a uh, separate thing to be to be done, and it's the best way to just have some sample configuration proper for your system. Let's imagine that we would like to put Node.js on the on this Raspberry Pi, and then put the Node.js. So please just uh, we'll just use some sample configurations here. We have configuration for a lot of boards here, so make a list uh, dev config here. Yeah, is it the right command? Hopefully. No. <laughs> ah, list of configs. Uh, oh, yes, yes, that's the right. So, um, not, no less, sorry. Oh, no less on this device. Sorry, more. Uh, maybe that's not the most efficient way. Yeah, so we have really. Uh, a lot of configurations for your for some custom boards. So as I said, each uh, producer of microcontroller is providing us some 
uh, let's say, tutorial boards, some sample boards that are nice to start prototyping. And really, I have that situation in previous company that I just uh, used the configuration. Uh, let's say we have the uh, some uh, microcontroller, and it was used on some of our de embedded devices, and the guys were like tweaking it and adding some additional functionality, but I just said, okay, maybe I could just start from using the configuration that is for the development board for this uh, for this microcontroller. So I just tried, I just don't use any of their extensions, I just tried what was provided here and maybe don't provide all of the uh, I.O. capabilities, but at least I could log in for the shell and it works. So really, there is really just the best, easiest way just to start from what's provided uh, in default, yeah? So, for example, that's how companies are creating their new product. So, okay, oh, Raspberry Pi or Bigelbone Black, whatever, they have a nice microcontroller, we'll just start build our prototype upon it, then let's change our hardware and let's change the configurations here. So, right now, we are making this default configuration for Raspberry Pi. Raspberry uh, Pi dev config, uh, dev. We are applying the default configuration for the Raspberry Pi, and now we can customize it, yeah? So, uh, make menu config here. And, yeah, so what we would like to have here, we are not interested in Linux kernel or whatever, uh, we just would like to have Node.js here, yeah? And, uh, Interpret languages and scripts. Sounds good, I believe. And uh, here, well, but that's the problem. It has a kind of dependency. So we need to uh, turn on some other flags. We need to add the support for the, uh, for the C++, for the compiler. We also need to enable the white characters and threads and so on. And they are hidden uh, somewhere in other, uh, in other, uh, let's say, uh, places here. But really, if you would like to compile it right now, it will take a, take a long time, and we really uh, we couldn't afford it. This one could take, I don't know, minimal configuration, strong server. Well, let's give it a try. Maybe we'll be able to compile at least this single system. But it's just if you'd like to enable the Node.js, just Enable the Node.js, you just find some of those uh, properties, like for example here, go to the tool chain, yeah, and here we could uh, enable this wi uh, white char support and some other enable C++ support and, and so on, and then we could add Node.js, but right now let's just uh, try to build it. And right now the process of uh, creating the cross compilers has been started so that because it's this is a different platform it's not the you no know, Intel 64 bytes it's just the, mm, an ARM microcontroller so we cannot directly compile for this architecture first we need to compile a cross compiler that could compile our code for this platform and that's happening right now creating the cross compiler compiling the Linux kernel compiling the uh, root file system, compiling the Node.js. Unfortunately, as you know, Node.js has a dependency on Python, so it, you know, it's just uh, you cannot say that you love Node.js and you hate Python, because you cannot build Node.js without having uh, Python first. Because the Node.js is using the build system from the uh, V8 engine and this, uh, and this uh, JavaScript engine is based on JIP which is generator project, which is make file like stuff. And yeah, and after after this process uh, will uh, will end, after everything will compile, after I know less than an hour, I believe that we have, <laughs> uh, we're not wait for that. <laughs> uh, we'll just have then SD card image that we can also, it's like the same kind of thing that we could directly download from the official uh, Raspberry Pi page, yeah. And there is also plenty of other stuff that are just different to configure. Some really old stuff that's really abandoned. This Linux target image builder. Some uh, strange German stuff, but looks really nice. <laughs> I really like this. I, I get, met the guys from this company, and this Pengu Training is really nice system, but it's just not that popular. The and Yocto, that's the most uh, you know hardcore stuff. 
But you know, uh, as I said, uh, cdynac.gitlab.io slash linux2019. If you have time, if you'd like to try, feel free to check it there. And also make some tests. How long does it take to compile different operating systems for different platforms and so on? And truly, Daisy's configuration is about, you know, uh, a little bit more than something between 10 and uh, 12 minus, just the minimal configuration. And uh, it could take up to one hour on some really strong hardware. Uh, but and using different, I'd say the results are quite uh, quite similar. And also, if we are uh, using the, if we have the weak machine, it really takes longer time. But still, I'm talking only about the basic configuration without the Node.js here. Yeah. So with Node.js, it will take I don't know twice as much or three times as much on such a strong machine. And that's really important. I also calculated the average costs of per let's say. Uh, per mm, uh, average cost of making this operation in the cloud. So it's really uh, nice to know that the slower machine you take, of course, it will take longer, but it's more cost effective. Maybe that's why Google used uh, some cheap computers in the beginning, because just, I don't know, it's just cheap to use uh, cheap hardware. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, and it's also some other idea that I have here, but as we are also short on time, we'll come to and then, uh, so as well as we could uh, choose the, we could also create with the same tools, with the same build tools, we can create compilers directly. I hope that you uh, know Docker. Who knows Docker? Yeah, so more than half on the, of you all. And uh, yeah, you know, Docker is uh, just containerization engine. It's kind of virtual machine, but less than a virtual machine. And it's, so there's also as easy. So as you can download your uh, Raspbian image for Raspberry, you can also download your um, Docker image from the cloud. But you can also build your own. So using, uh, you can just don You should need just to download the Docker Docker engine. And if you just and you can just you know download your Alpine and you're in the Alpine. But also, if you uh, just make some little uh, uh, if you just create, choose as a target, not the ARM platform, not the Raspberry Pi, but the uh, X86 uh, systems or just 64 uh, bytes system, if you choose it as a target, and if you build an image, you can just basically create the container out of it. So that's also the very nice idea. We could, using the same code, the same build system, we could create the Mm, we could create the code for the embedded device and just changing one of the compiler's options, we can build a container in the web. So that's really something that I, that I like. Well, use cases while I am using over here, well, I am some of the project in my, one of the previous companies, but I'm still continuing it. I create some Node.js SCADA on the studies. I will teach that SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition. Well, basically it's something about collecting the data, displaying them and manipulating it. Yes, so some kind of, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, we have a building plan where we have some lights, you have some heat, vacuum, air condition, you can control it, you can see the plots and, uh, and so on. And it's all uh, written in, uh, it was initially written just in the NCC and it was based on the upper server, but one time I discovered, well, if I write something in C and I, uh, but I need to create, I need to set up the Apache, but why could I, why couldn't I make everything in one place? And then I found that Node.js is existing and I just written everything in Node.js. Uh, I believe to, I hope I will put this project in the open source at one time, but I also saw there was a request, okay, so Clean don't want to pay for additional machine to have your server. He just would like to, you know, uh, pay a note. I had 200 zlotys or 200 zlotys to have some cheap device and put it on there. Well, maybe you could just use the embedded device and put the same software that I'm paying on the, putting on the server. Maybe it could be also put into the embedded system. Uh, for that, I was using the Beagle Black platform. We have a use case for that. It's really a similar, similar board, and it's also better that it has its own um, SSD <laughs> memory, let's say SSD drive. Because, as you know, the SD card sucks. They could uh, just you have, could have some rubbish on there. Here you can you just upload your 
code on directly on the um, on the chip, yeah, yeah, the memory, and that's better. And as I heard at least a week ago, this uh, Node.js application is running more than two years in one place, and it's uh, really it's really nice. So it's yeah, it seems that you could run the Node.js on the bedet, and it's uh, it it will work as as uh, as as nice as you could just create the. Uh, I know C++ applications or Python applications in a bit. Well, so it's really nice. I think that if you are really experienced with the creating your micro, micro web microservices and Node.js application, you could just try to put it on embedded, and you can have some benefits uh, uh, out of it. If I believe it's quite uh, uh, portable, at least just try. Why not? Maybe your customer could pay for the power and just could pay your bills. Maybe you don't need to have it everything in the cloud. Yeah. And yeah, it's also nice that you could, you know, uh, change the place of code execution. You could create cheaper devices uh, and put your Node.js code in the cloud, but you can put also Node.js code on the embedded devices. And that's, that's nice that you can still, it's possible to use the, same, use the same code. And also just remember, please don't use the already prepared Raspbian images and so on. Just try to create your own uh, distribution out of the existing tools like BuildRoot or Yocto Project. It's really... Uh, it's not that uh, scary. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, bibliography. And uh, any questions or comments for that? Thanks. Yes, Corvus. Are the use cases or so applicable in the embedded systems or not really? Uh, well, I heard about it, but it's just rather like an uh, experiment because it is, you know, it's quite an overhead to make it in that way. And uh, I think that also uh, as we could just create this, uh, as we could create the containers from the embedded systems, that's the other way around. It's really, it will be really more optimized because for what we are taking care about uh, for the embedded devices is to use the cheapest possible hardware, yeah? So I heard about those in initiatives, for example, especially the CoreOS, yeah? It's also in some, yeah, Edinburgh last year, <laughs> some people were uh, talking about it, but it's, uh, you know, it's still not that much uh, popular in the, in the market, in the production. But I believe also, well, we could basically, uh, if we could compile the whole system, maybe we could just compile only the Docker. We can compile Docker engine for ARM uh, mic controllers and also compile the uh, Docker images for, uh, for that. Yeah, but it's like, uh, it's still something experimental, but I hope it will emerge then. Some other questions or comments? Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Out of the CentOS um, distribution. So, what I did, uh, I downloaded the repa repa basic CentOS, mm -hmm. and in that, the make this code environment. So, mm -hmm. you know, it made it yeah, yeah. from more from OpenStack mm -hmm. or CentOS or Red Hat. Uh, they got on this node and it created it as a basic mm -hmm. code environment. And what I did, I installed the make desktop, and the system is running fine, but I'm now struggling. I will recommend you to try that because uh, what is being created here is not the um, well. Okay, it's the image that you could put uh, directly on your um, on your drive, yeah. Because as I understand, the ISO uh, images is something that uh, on those on this ISO image you have the installer, right? So it's not directly the image of a system, but is a 
installer. So it's a set of tools with those packages. So I think if you would like to really create, I also make a try for that. So you can build any kind of system. You could build the software for embedded systems. You could build some containers for the cloud. And you could also build something for your workstation. I also have tried for that for my previous computer. And it's, uh, uh, it's really could be harder because on embedded systems, it's really easy to run some you know, networking stuff and some basic peripherals. But uh, with those systems, it could be harder to configure your own uh, your graphic stuff and so on, because it possibly could not fit your graphic card and so on. Then you can run into some issues. But if you'd like to really, uh, that's really a nice, nice exercise and could be, you know, it could be really a great hacker if you make it. It's close to like compiling your own Gentoo, but even more hardcore <laughs> like this. So uh, yeah, you could try, but then I will recommend you not to use uh, build root because it has some uh, limitations there. It doesn't support those uh, graphics stuff. I believe that, that well, those packages, maybe it will be better to try with the Yocto project because it has nice layers for that. That can be an idea. Yeah. Ah, yeah, on the embedded platforms, you mean? I would say, really, uh, no problem. What people are running some, you know, web services on their, I know, routers, for example, because when you uh, log in to the router, you just always have some web uh, web interface. For various of embedded devices, people are creating, you know, web servers using Python. Why Python is better than Node.js? That's the problem that it's a dependency to build the Node.js. But basically, if you'd like to, people are creating some strange uh, things with, I don't know, Ruby uh, on embedded. Uh, they are also using the C++ to create web servers. I heard about some project to create web servers with simple stuff, but really, that's what Node.js is built for. It's for creating the uh, Web, uh, web services to host the web pages and so on. And if a lot of embedded devices just need to have some web interface for the customer, that's really nice. And truly, really as it's also not just being advertised as being faster than other scripting languages, so of course, maybe it would be not uh, obviously faster than plain C or whatever, but uh, I believe that it's really, if you would like to make something uh, higher level, it's, it's not a problem. Really, memory consumption is... Uh, uh, I didn't experience any problems here, but the biggest, <laughs> the really big obstacle here is using the NPM. So, okay, Node.js programs itself on embedded, they run really smoothly. I think the moral problem was with the, on this uh, project with uh, Big and Blue Black they had, the some bigger problem was with the network connections, so I make some too much pulling. So it was rather the problem, the limitations of embedded systems here was with the data traffic and handling the network connection. Node.js was not the problem. The problem was is NPM. Really, it's really the best to just configure an NPM packages first and deploy it on your hard drive. If you'd like to use the NPM on the embedded platform by command line, that could be a really nice area. Yeah? So remember about, remember about that. And also, if you'd like to experiment also, on the experiment or the Node.js problem, remember to set the correct time or connect it to the internet, or just to install the uh, uh, NTP server. Because when you are using NPM on the uh, embedded, if, if you are using NPM, you need to have the valid certificate. And uh, when you just run OK, NPM install something, or sorry, it's uh, 1970. Those certificates are not yet valid. Yeah, so <laughs> so basically, Node.js is not a problem. In any case, the NPM could be a obstacle here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. Exactly. So, as you heard, yeah, Raspberry Pi Zero. So the smallest one. Yeah. 
yeah, really. A lot of people are thinking really, oh, Node.js, especially the embedded developers, they like Python. I don't know why they like so much Python, but they really are really, they don't like uh, Node.js that much because I know it's being used in the web. So if something is being used in the web, it shouldn't fit embedded. Why? It's from the different different world. I had this problem, but really just please prove me that embedded J, that Node.js will not work embedded system. Please prove me and uh, I could prove you that it works, yeah? as you said, even on the Raspberry Pi Zero. So also the problem here and about portability are those packages that are being also compiled. I also, uh, whatever I'm doing, I'm trying to find the equivalent that is that you don't need to compile it because some of the packages, for example, I think SQLite is one of the examples when at least this default package that just have the name SQLite yeah, package, it just, uh, you need to uh, compiled because it's using some of this none, yeah, this node abstraction, uh, whatever, that's just force you to uh, compile those modules and to create the compiled modules that will be playing uh, with the um, Node.js API itself. So that's also a problem here that you think need to think about it first. Well, I basically uh, try to find the equivalents that don't need the compilation. Maybe it could be a no. Not that optimal, I don't know, but really that could be an issue if you are using different uh, different hardware. You just also need to think about compiling or previously compiling your uh, custom NPM packages. Yeah, that's all. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Wojciech Krzyszak, and I'm the CEO of the company called Software Brothers here in Wrocław. And I'm going to tell you about the library which we built during the last... Uh, recently, basically. Uh, the library is Admin Bro. This is the admin panel for the things written in Node.js. So you could plug this to the application written in Node.js, and you will have the admin panel just like that. Okay? I have three goals in my talk, okay? First of all, what I want to tell you, basically, uh, I want to tell you how you can inter incorporate Admin Bro in your projects and speed up the development time of your application written in Node. The second thing is that I want to, to encourage you to use that. Even if you don't have the production applications written in Node, uh, maybe you could just download the, uh, download the library and try using that and give us a feedback because I believe that the more people are using that, the more feedback I have and the better uh, product we'll be able to build. Uh, everything is open source without the um, fee and it won't be, uh, and it will be for, for free. So uh, yes, this is the second goal. And the third goal is that I would like to share our experience with building the such uh, library. Uh, a couple of examples, a couple of problems we've, we've had, uh, that maybe you will learn something which we did in the last couple of uh, weeks. Okay? And this is the plan. This is the, the plan of achieving those goals. The, first of all, I will tell you something about Admin Bro, what it is, uh, how we can use that. Uh, not too much, because there will be a fun part, which will be the live coding. So we will add Admin Panel to the, <laughs> let's say, real application which I built in the morning. Uh, then I will tell you about the uh, design choices we did. This is the challenges part. And after that, I will have one slide uh, with the future of the Admin Bro. Okay, so what will come into, in, in, in the next weeks. And summary and question and answer section. If you will have any questions, just feel free to interrupt me and I will answer them. If you are a shy person, you could just ask in the, uh, in the last slide. So, uh, is it okay? Perfect. What Admin Bro is? Uh, 
Yeah. Admin Bro is an, as I mentioned, is an admin panel which can plug into the application. This is the screen of the of the panel dashboard, basically. Uh, prepared by the designers. This is not a real application. I will show you how the real, real application looks like. But yeah, on the left you have the resources. You could just click on them and manage them. Uh, yeah. A uh, couple of things about the background. Why we basically build that, you know? Why we spend some time to, to develop an open source admin panel for Node.js. So I'm the Ruby on Rails, I was the Ruby on Rails developer. Uh, I started with that like 10 years ago. And what I loved initially about Ruby and Ruby on Rails is that it had, at the time, lots of plugins. Plugins first, then gems, you know? And you could just reuse the code who uh, somebody else did, uh, built. So for instance, you could just add the authentication system just like that, you know, to the real application. Or you could uh, add the admin panel to the real applications. And we used it quite uh, often for clients in Poland. Uh, when we have the startup, you know, with the API, for instance, and we wanted to manage the data somehow, create the populated resources and so on. We used two, two, two admin panels. It was, uh, well, first of all, we used the active admin, and the second was the race admin, those two libraries. And then I started uh, experimenting with Meteor, and company we started experimenting with Meteor it was four years ago, like five, and uh, I had the same problem. So I've built the application very, very fast in Meteor, just like days, and then I thought, okay, I will have to have some kind of tool which allows me to, will allow me to manage those data. And I started to looking on those, uh, those applications in the node world, and four years ago, there was nothing, you know, literally nothing. And then, a uh, couple of years after that, after uh, what, I, what I did, I launched another server with Ruby, or, uh, Ruby and Ruby Rays, and I installed the active admin connected to the database, and this is how I built the admin panel, uh, by using Ruby. Uh, was silly, but four years after that, so I started experimenting with uh, React Native because I wanted to build some kind of React Native application just for fun, you know, to see how it looks because I worked with Cordova in the past and well, it was awful. Uh, so I needed the API. So I built the API with Node very, very fast. And then I needed an admin, an admin panel. And right now there is a similar situation. There is no such thing as, as, as those tools available for Ruby or for Python, for instance, uh, where we have the Django admin, for instance. Uh, there is Keystone.js, which is something like content management system. And there is an Express admin. This library is like standalone admin panel. It's not pluggable to your application, but you could just launch it as a separate server. It uses Express to serve this route. So we decided to do such things. Uh, so, such thing. uh, during the weekend, we've built the prototype, which worked. And then we added designs, uh, more features, and so on. And after two months, uh, we have things which I will show you. And this is it, the fun coding part. Do you have any questions regarding admin right now? OK, no. So let's move to the, to the fun part. Uh, OK. I have the code of the application. I will show you the code first, OK? So this is the Node.js application, which I created today. And it really doesn't work fully, but it, have, it has a couple of models and also a couple of routes. I will show you them. And it is based on the HappyJS framework. I'm not sure if you are familiar with HappyJS. Some of you are, some not. This is something like Express, but different, basically. Uh, I use that because it has the Swagger uh, configuration. Uh, I will show you later. So we have the server definition. Uh, we define that it launched on the port 8080. This is from, taken from the environmental variables. Then we have uh, authentication for routes. We use the JSON Web Token. Uh, the Swagger uh, definition, which I will show you uh, briefly later, and the roots. And in the end, we start the server. We connect to the database, and we launch the server. Uh, so let's open it, OK? I have Docker container uh, pre uh, prepared, so I will use that. OK, so I will, I will just launch it. It creates the Mongo because it uses uh, in source, we have models, five models, okay? And it uses Mo Mongo and Mongoose library to connect to the database, okay? 
So it's, those models are super simple. Uh, OK, so let's uh, wait a little bit. Uh, OK, application is running. It's running on the port 8080. OK, nothing is there because there is no, 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 no element on the host, on the, on the root. So we could just use the documentation. This is the Swagger documentation for the, for the application. So the idea was to create an application which allows you to order a food, you know, from the health providers, something like feed catering or body chef here in Wrocław. So we have vendors somewhere here. This is the companies we have, which have uh, uh, basically which offer food. They have the food plans and users can order food plans by creating an order, which is here. Simple. When we will see the models, we see that we have food plan, we have order, we have user, and we have vendor. OK. So let's add uh, an admin to that, OK? So admin bro. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned before, admin bro could be plugged into the almost any from a fr backend framework. You could plug into Express, HappyJS, whatever else. You could just write your own connectors. We are using the HappyJS, so uh, on the HappyJS page, there's a plugin, plugin section, and admin bro is there. So there's a plugin admin bro, HappyJS. Uh, here is a link to the documentation. Uh, so we have to install basically this plugin and uh, use it in this way, okay? So I will do this. Uh, let me just enter the Docker Compose, okay? And I will install admin bro. Those two, sorry. Okay, those two libraries. And next thing, thing what we will do is we will basically uh, add this server to the HappyJS framework, okay? We are doing this by copying this part of code. Since this is the happy, J happy J JS works in a way it, it has a plugins basically. You can just use these plugins uh, into to add these plugins to the server definition. So we will do the same thing with the admin bro. Okay, so we'll use the server object which happy creates, and we will add the admin bro plugin to it. Okay, and we'll pass the options. Right now, I will just pass the empty object, okay? Because baby steps. Uh, we just need to require this admin bro plugin on the top. It would be interesting uh, in, in, in like two minutes. Okay. Everything is installed, server is uh, reset. And uh, admin should appear on, def on default root admin. It won't work. Okay, it won't work. I will tell you how. Because here in the code, we have the authentication set. And all the routes require authentication, so I will just comment this out for the purpose of this, specific, uh, for this, for this talk and refresh. And we have admin panel there. Empty right now, but give me two more minutes, I will fill this up, okay? So basically, we have to add our resources here. We can do this by passing. Okay, no, let's make this more organized. So I will create an admin folder here. Okay, and uh, pass all the configuration which we will do here. Okay, to index.js file. Uh, are you following me? Perfect. If you want, just um, Voitex stop or explain. Okay, so we have this empty object here. I will close those those files. Give me a second. Okay, and I'll open everything again, okay? To make it less clutter. So we have this server definition. Here we'll just have the options and I will require that, that options. Here. Okay, and go there and add configuration here. Uh, 
on the documentation, which you saw, there is a lot of things you can change. You can change, for instance, the company name, their logo, and whatever. Remove our link to our page uh, as well. But the, the, the most important thing is the adding resources. So we, we will do this. Resources are, uh, could be added by passing the old models in an array. So we'll do this. Resources, an array. OK, we just need to require those resources. So. Okay, I will show you how, how this looks. So we have models. This is what we are requiring right now. Object with a particular model uh, included as a key. So let's pass this to the configuration. Models, foot plan, models, order, models, user, and models, sorry, vendor. OK, I saved that. There's an error. And there's an error saying that there's, there are no adapters supporting one of the resources you provided. So entire idea of Admin Bro is that it, it could be plugged into any Node.js application. And in Node.js world, you have different frameworks. You have HappyJS, uh, you have Express, you have Loopback, whatever, you know, dozens of them. And also, you have different ORMs. You have Mongoose, for in, which allows you to connect to the MongoDB base, that base. You have SQLize, you have Watermelon, you have a bunch of other things, you know? And the idea of Admin Bro is not to connect with one thing, but give you the ability to uh, present resources of, of any kind. So this is the idea. So, and we have the connectors, basically adapters, to a bunch of things, you know? And uh, one of these is the uh, Mongoose. So we have to install the adapter for Mongoose database because we are using Mongoose. So let's do that. We are installing admin bro mongoose. This is the library which allows us to, to add the mongoose uh, models. And we have to initialize this adapter. So we require, require admin bro. This is the core library. Okay. And we have to uh, register the adapter. This is the one function which we invoke on admin bro. OK. And now it should work, hopefully. OK, it should work. Let's refresh the page. OK, and we have those four models right now. OK? Uh, let me stop right now, and because this is quite complicated. Complicated to explain. So again, we have one core library, admin bro, which takes care of all of this. Uh, then we have, let's say, mapping of roots of admin bro to the particular framework, because happy JS handles roots different way than Express, for instance. Uh, and the, this is the one story. And the second story is that we have to have the connector to the database. We use the Mongoose connector, OK? You could even wrap an a existing API and have the API here. So what do we have right now? Let's use the vendor, because I've prepared my talk on this example. So let's add a new vendor, OK? This vendor, let, let it be. So OK. <laughs> Admin Bro allows you to perform all the operation on, on resources. You can create new resources, edit them, see the details, and list them and also remove. So that will be no JS food provider. OK. Rotslav Street will be, what's the street of this place? You know? Oh. OK. Location of Rotslav. I have this opened here. I've prepared. OK, and la longitude, latitude, and save. And we have this new record in the database. It's on the list. We can filter all those resources here. So if I just put it here, there would be no, nothing. Uh, OK, let's just find mode just to see if it works. It works. 
Uh, OK, so we have this one element. Uh, usually, when we, you build the admin panel for the client, uh, you don't want to, him to see this, or basically, yeah, just that. And uh, I would like to hide this element. So we can do this in admin bro as well. So what we can do is, sorry, uh, we can pass more options and modify particular resources. So we will modify vendor resources. We have two options of passing this <laughs> too much resources word. We have two options for pass passing resources. One is elements of, uh, as an array. The second is uh, as an object. And those objects will have, this object will have two keys. One will be resource, obvious, and options, less obvious. So we can change name. Let's name it Vendor Dostawca. OK. Let's refresh the page. And we have Dostawca. Perfect. Uh, we can define which fields are there as well. So it will be the list properties. So I'm just showing you a random options, you know, to, to give you a glimpse what's possible. You know, I don't want to show all the, possi possi uh, all the things which we uh, can do because I don't have much time. But uh, I hope you will be encouraged to, to use that. So let's have here a name, a city. Sorry. What else? Street. And this is it. Street, and this is it. Uh, refresh page. OK, and we have this. OK, next, what we would like to have, probably, we would like to have the Google map here, you know, because lot longitude and latitude is not the things easy to perceive from the client, for instance. Uh, so let's add this field. Uh, we can modify existing fields, how they behave in the list, in the show, or, or in the edit. Or we can add new fields, so we will add new field. And the field will be location. Sorry. Uh, like that. First of all, do you follow me? All of you? OK. Perfect. And you? <laughs> Even you. Uh, OK, so we have the properties object. And we have location there, because location is the new field we, we are creating. And this location, OK, I will just save this and see if it works. I don't know if it will work. Yeah, it has. Because I didn't, uh, we have the location field here, you know? Because I didn't specify nothing there. And there is only the label or there is some empty? Right, it's just the label and yeah. We have to define the render function, okay? So yeah, let's define the render function. Uh, we have four render functions, one for the edit, one for the show, one for the list, and one for the filter. Makes sense. So we will define the show. Uh, show uh, render function. And it takes three arguments, which I will write in a minute, but it renders an HTML. So HTML. HTML is there. OK, so let's, uh, let's add a Google map. So first of all, uh, show takes three arguments. One is the uh, actual uh, property. Uh, then we have the record and helpers. Uh, helpers are for, OK, property is the actual property, location, which is wrapper around the property. Uh, record is a wrapper around the um, one record. So we have the one interface, which allows you to, to communicate with the different type of resources. So SQLize uh, resource or Mongoose resource. And we have the helpers. Helpers are the bunch of things, bunch of uh, fun functions, which allows you to create a link, for instance, to different parts of the system. OK. okay. Uh, I have here the Google Maps platform from developers opened. And here is an example how to add that. I will just copy that. OK, you don't mind? OK, let's copy that. And wrap it in a script. It won't work because I didn't use the correct String definition, okay. So we have this. 
I will change the longitude and latitude, okay? So we can just use that. Uh, it will be record param from, in our case, it will be location uh, lat. I will tell you why in a minute. Okay, so fields could, could be nested. In our case, we are modifying the vendor resource, and vendor resource looks like this. So you have name, city, street, location, and location is ne uh, have two nested fields. One is latitude, and second is latitude. That's why we use the dot notation. Latitude. Right. Ah, uh, yes. But thank you for your good eyes. Not so good. <laughs> okay, I will just remove the comments uh, to make it simpler. And okay, save it. I just need to add the div tag with ID map. Again, this is taken from the uh, Google page. Uh, and I will have to add the uh, size of the wrapper. So, four hundred? Yeah. Okay. Let's refresh the page. And it won't work. Yeah. It won't work because we have to include the Google page uh, script on the head of the application. We can do this here as well because there is a parameter which uh, allows us to do that. There is a head. So here we can uh, include uh, two kind of uh, two kind of external uh, files. We could include uh, scripts or styles. We won't have any styles, so I will just pass an empty array. But we have the, we will have the scripts. Uh, and scripts go back to the to the Google Cloud, so so to the Google Maps platform, and this is what we have to include in the head of the of the page. Okay. I will change the API with my API key. No. Forget that, please. I will change this after the presentation, definitely. So we have head style scripts refresh. Okay, it should work. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, it works. Yeah! This was the hardest part of the, of the presentation. <laughs> so we have Google Maps embedded in the, in the page. Uh, so as you can see, you can just modify the existing fields, add new fields. Uh, yeah, and this is it. <laughs> uh, yes? Uh, so basically, yeah, uh, this is, this is, it's not linked. Yeah, this, is, this is for the head, yeah? Yeah. yeah. And I do the same for the... Here? Yeah, for the location. <laughs> you ca yeah, you yeah, can just, uh, sorry. Okay. You can, yeah. what you can do is you can copy this and paste it here. Sorry. <laughs> basically. But it will be uh, downloaded every, uh, every field. Uh, the idea of the head is that, uh, let's imagine you have the Google Maps of the... Not basically two, two Google Maps on the one page. You don't want to uh, include the two scripts in the head. So you just uh, add this to the scripts, and the system will verify whether you have duplicates or not, and include just one uh, script. Okay, so does it make sense? Everything is clear? Okay. Uh, Again, I spent 30 minutes and I've added completed uh, admin panel to the to the application. Uh, let's add some kind of uh, dashboard because when we are working with clients, you know they love dashboards. They pay for dashboards, so let's add one. Uh, dashboard is here, so when you click on the company name, you have the dashboard. Uh, by default, it's empty, but you can use something called page builder. So we've bu uh, we we define a class which is page builder, which allows you to basically build the page from the widgets, 
We define a couple of widgets, and you could just build a quite useful page from that. Uh, I will just copy this example, okay, and I'll tell you what it does. Sorry, go back to the to the to the mm, to the file. Uh, let's use the dashboard property for the options. Okay, and let's create the dashboard page. Okay, and now create this file. So what we are doing right now, we are including the page builder, which is a class we built, and then we extend this page builder by cre creating our own dashboard page. And in constructor, we uh, set the title as subtitle property, and then we write the uh, function build where we add the one block which is the published articles. I will just change this value to like 10. Uh, we can just use the uh, data from the database. Uh, let's refresh that. So I uh, see if there are no errors. Okay, there are no. So let's refresh the page. And we have custom dashboard with this one published article block. Uh, you could add multiple blocks. Uh, and let's define maybe Plus me. Oh. And let it span to nine columns. So this is it. Uh, when you go to the mm, documentation of Page Builder, it has a couple of widgets. You have widgets for, give me a second, I'll just scroll down, for this simple block. Uh, also, you could just add a chart. We use the Chart.js library in order to do that. So you could just add an all charts possible. Uh, you could have the list like that. And also you could have the uh, table like that. So basically you could just build a dashboard page quite easily. Uh, and this is everything from my coding part. I will just show you one example, okay? Because we have a demo page. Uh, give me a second. Demo page is here. It's on Heracle, so it will take a minute to launch. Okay, so this is the demo page uh, with dashboard and so on. And here you have, for instance, a specific editor here. So you, when you just edit this resource, you have the cool editor. So it's possible. You could add your own uh, types, as you saw, with the, uh, with the location. Uh, we also have the custom actions. So uh, you can I will just add something. You can add, uh, you can add the fields to the resources, on, and you could add actions. For instance, this is a don't touch this action with a warning. So we could just use that for the publish or remove or deactivate, whatever. Uh, yeah, let's not take me there. And there's a cut. Uh, actions have two types. Uh, one of the types is the record action for partic particular record. And the second type is the resource action. So for instance, here we have the resource statistics. You could just add separate uh, statistics to the particular resource. Uh, next, we have the customize info page. So not only you can, sorry, but this is the open thing. So people are, okay, removing those, uh, those elements. And you could add the, you could use the page builder inside the resources, so as well. And yeah, this is it from the live coding part. Uh, you have any questions regarding that? Everything is clear? Okay, perfect. So let me summarize what I told you. Uh, first of all, and it took like, okay, 30 minutes, something like that. And we've added the admin panel to the application. Uh, usually we, we will charge the client, charge the client like for two days for that. Uh, so we initialized the admin bro by using happy.js uh, plugin. 
Then we added the scaffold resources by using the Admin Bromongus adapter. Then we modified the source properties by adding the map to the, to the list of properties, and we created the dashboard. So this is what we did during the last 30 minutes using the Admin Bro. If you don't have any questions regarding that part and everything is clear, I will uh, gradually move to the challenges. So three challenges we, we had uh, during the development. Uh, first challenge is functional versus object-oriented programming. So, and why Ruby messed me up. So, I will start with that, okay? In Ruby, everything is an object, even a class is an object. So, after you now six years of uh, working on Ruby uh, applications, I, I basically uh, perceive everything as, a, as an object. And when we started doing that, uh, we tried to objectify everything, you know? Uh, that's why we have the page builder, which is an object. But it's not the, always the correct way of doing things. You have also functional pro programming. So let me, let me right now go to the theory right now. In functional programming, uh, all the elements in, in, in the application code could be perceived as the function. Function has the input, properties, by par par parameters, the computation inside, and the output. And one basically uh, relies on the other. Uh, you don't, uh, and there's a cool thing call, called pure functions. Uh, pure functions are functions which don't, don't have uh, side effects. They have just an input, just an output, nothing else. No magic inside, you know? Uh, Object-oriented programming, on the other hand, is the paradigm which basically relies on the objects. So you treat uh, your application as a bunch of objects, not actions. Uh, why this is awesome? This is awesome because there is no magic. Uh, I'm not sure if you if you saw this in the example I've, I've presented. So you, we, we overwrite the render function. Render function was a pure function. It has it had three elements. One was the record, property, and helpers, and simple output, HTML code, you know, uh, written in string. So this is the easy thing to do for newcomers because they see the function, they see the input, output, and this is easy. Uh, Object-oriented programming we use in the page builder, and there you have the this keyword, you know? So you have to know that this dot title is the property which uh, represents the title of the page, you know, and so on. Maybe we'll change that in, in the future, but uh, we, we have more, more things to do right now, uh, which I'll tell you uh, uh, in the last slide. But what I want to, to tell you is that object-oriented programming is not always the best solution. You have different options, especially in JavaScript when you have functions. Okay, the second challenge was modular structure. So we started with one repository, just one, uh, during the weekend. Everything was there, you know, the adapter to the Mongo, uh, HappyJS uh, uh, framework, uh, HappyJS connector, and so on. And then we gradually start removing those things to the different repositories. So what we did in the end, we created a master repo which is here, sorry, it's not here. <laughs> uh, which, con uh, which, have, which has lots of uh, tools we use. We have SQLize, Adapter, Mongoose, and so on here. Everything is linked as the Git submodules at this uh, Setup allows us to control everything and also allows new people to build new libraries easily as well. Uh, the challenge is connected with that is that okay, okay, we have one infrastructure folder which launch everything. Okay, and problems with that, working uh, uh, on a local version of uh, packages. So, so here we have the Node.js packages because they are published in NPM. And we are working not on the NPM versions, but on the local versions. And we use this uh, yarn link in order to do that. What the yarn link does is it creates a sim link to the, uh, in, inside your node modules. It doesn't fetch a mo uh, particular module from the NPM, but sim links to a different folder. So it put this inside of other, uh, other objects. So, uh, and my experience with that is that yarn link is better than uh, npm link because of different random errors we had in the development phase. And the second thing, what we learned in the modular stru stru structure is dependency tree. Again, Ruby on Rails. 
Ruby has gem system, and this gem system uh, resolves dependency. So when you build an application, there is no way of having two versions of the one one dependency in the in the application. Here, in Node.js, on the other hand, <laughs> no, 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 this is not the default uh, approach how npm works. So when we have the application, let's say this application which we we had. Uh, and it requires Mongoose in version 5, 4, 16, let's say. And we require admin bro Mongoose, which requires also Mongoose. And PM will, will use two versions of this Mongoose. And in Mongoose, we are uh, checking if given resources is Mongoose model. So we are using something like this. Since we are creating models here and passing here, it will be always false because those are two versions of, of the same library, two separate files. Uh, to solve that, you can use the per dependency. Uh, per dependency works in, as a standard dependency in Ruby, so you will have just the one version. And this is how plugins are built in Node.js. OK, uh, the last, in my opinion, the most, most important uh, challenge was documentation and the cards of knowledge. This is the definition of cards of knowledge. And basically, this is the, my problem right now. I've built the admin bro. You know, uh, we designed this in, in, in our company, and I know everything about that. And now I have to explain you how it works, you know? And I have to put myself in the shoes of uh, people who doesn't know nothing about admin bro. And we had lots of problems with that, you know? Because uh, I, from the beginning, work on the uh, such libraries as admin bro, uh, sorry, as uh, active admin race admin on Django, Django admin, and I know the goal of that, you know, the business purpose. But when we start posting information about admin bro to the internet, people were asking, okay, guys, but what they are doing? Why? You know, pff, you are not solving any problems, you know, just do something uh, useful. And then I started to change the communication of, of that. Uh, and uh, people started to get it, you know, in, in Node.js world. The second problem is that problem w I, which I had uh, three days ago. You know, I asked my uh, colleague in work to use that in Brown production client, you know, and ask him, okay, uh, Simon, because this is his name. Simon, please tell me your feedback about using this application because you are the new guy who, who used that, so you have the fresh, uh, you could have a fresh look of that. And he, he told me, Void, okay, everything is awesome, but you don't have anywhere the installation instructions in the, in the documentation. Let, I will show you that, okay? Because this is the mind blowing. I didn't know that. So when you go to Admin Bro, we spent a lot of time of building the documentation. You have this quite business uh, inform information from business perspective, what it is. Then you have getting started, you know, documentation like demo, you click on the documentation and there is no installation instruction. Nothing, you know? <laughs> so he went there and he, he, he tried to find the, the, the information how to install this library, you know? <laughs> how to start using that and there is no such thing. We have the example app, but we don't have installation instructions. So this is the curse of knowledge and I don't have uh, any solution for that apart from asking you to use that and give me a feedback, okay? Maybe you'll we'll spot something interesting and uh, allow us to build better software. This is everything from those challenges and the future, okay? So I will just briefly tell you about the future of that. So currently in our application, because you know, it, it's a bit beta version. So in our application, we uh, are implementing this on our website as a content management system to manage uh, different things, and we also implement, started implementing that in a real production uh, client from scratch. And this is the things which we have to do in the beginning. The, the, this, this thing, relation between the resources, we don't have this. You could implement the relationship, I mean, has many, belongs to uh, many to many relationship. You can, you, you can implement that uh, by overriding those properties but you will perform uh, n plus one uh, request to the database, so which is not optimal. So we have to add some structural, stru structural way of doing that. And then front-end framework. Right now, everything is model view controller, plus a bunch of other things. Uh, it would be nice to have the more dynamic user interface and uh, incorpor incorporate maybe view, maybe React uh, to that. Uh, the biggest challenge with that will be the passing options from the backend to the front-end because we, 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 you know, we, we, we've moved HTML, we defined uh, the HTML on the backend, 
which will, wa was uh, rendered on the front end. So we will have to do this with the front end framework. And uh, then adapt adapters, Redis for sure. Uh, the guys on the internet uh, tells us to, to implement uh, GraphQL, probably after that, and still docs improvements. This is the most important things for now. Uh, okay, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, Let's go back to the summary. So I told you about those things. I told you about the Alimbro, what it is. I hope I, after this, this, this talk, you will go to home and uh, visit the Alimbro and, of course, give a star. After that, download it. <laughs> Just launch the example app. Okay? There is no installation instruction, so you have to figure it out on your own. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I showed you that, how to, how to do that. Uh, I told you about the, those design choices. The biggest design choice was functional versus object-oriented, from my perspective. Told you about the future, and now is the time for the summary. Uh, sorry, the question and answer. So do you have any questions? Thank you. Do you have any questions? Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'm also from that part of the Tunisian that I also uh, I'm not familiar with those no Rubian on the race idea and so on the dark voice, right? I was not from not from this uh, world. I also think about uh, how this connection to database uh, works, how this persistence of uh, data is working and uh, I believe that one thing is uh, collecting the information about uh, how the you know, how the data is being uh, added, how the record, uh, record, uh, record, uh, reports are being added, but will this uh, add also work in some you know, microservices environment in Kubernetes? For example, we have multiple applications that will do the same functionality, and we just like to you know, scale it up, scale it down, running separate services. Will it also work with that, or, or not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 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 no, 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 uh, long, 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 longer answer. So uh, we have in our company the application which uh, scrapes lots of servers. And we use the Raze admin in order to manage those things. So switching this to the this admin bro is, will be quite easy. Basically, you will have to have the information about the servers inside the, da inside the, uh, inside the uh, database, basically. And the Carl, another colleague of my uh, my colleague, uh, colleague on in work, he told me that there will be a nice feature to add here a um, wrapper for an API. So okay, right now we have the database, the right connection to the database, but we can also wrap an existing API. And it's possible right now, uh, right, right now uh, with this uh, code, but we don't have this in the documentation how to do that. So we'll have to dive into the, in, in the, into the code to do this. But this is quite easy to do, you know, the couple of lines. So we will have database connection with Mongoose, with SQL, with the Redis in the future, and you also can wrap your API. So if you have RESTful API, you could just wrap this. Uh, Something like that, yeah. Any other questions? I have some about, about uh, let's say we have a situation that we have a very large app with a lot of records and mm -hmm. vendors and stuff. Do you have anything? manage the state of the app? The state? What do you mean by state? Uh, because I'm comparing this to the React Redux world. Uh -huh, okay. If you wanted to do some something more dynamic, like rendering uh, oh. graph with statistics and... Uh, yeah, yeah. Right now, uh, this is the, the future, you know? Uh, implementing the front-end framework. Right now, everything is static. Rendered, uh, rendered on the back-end. So we, re we render on the back-end using the PUC rendering uh, system. And then we send this to the to the front end with simple get response. Uh, the challenge we will have will be to implement the front end framework, view or React, and then make everything more dynamic. But this is not right now. Next week. So don't use admin admin uh, uh, sorry admin bro on uh, end of the system. <laughs> right now, yeah. Uh, any more questions? We'll use that. After going home? Yeah. So what, what, how do you position this by outside of the company? So this is your internal tool. You'll, you'll be kind of building a stuff for commercial clients with that. 
Uh, how do you connect that outside? Like, do you, do you just say, if you're a web developer, use this for your clients, or is that a message to? Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Strapi is quite different because it's it's crazy too. You know, I once uh, used that, and it's not only a CMS, but it allows you to basically produce a code. You can just click entire interface, you know, and uh, you have the. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, this is not the idea. The idea is that you have, you are the startup owner. You know, uh, it's very, very easy to build an API and build a React native application, for instance. You know, but uh, right now it's not an easy way to build an admin dashboard. We are going to change that. We are going to give this to the. We, we already did, did. We already gave this to the users, and they just have to use it free. And uh, our idea is to maybe we guys from. Poland from Wrocław can speed up the development of the application node from weeks to hours, you know, by using that. So this is the idea, and we're free for always. Do you hear that? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, camera. Uh, okay, gentlemen and lady, uh, this is a summary. So if you would like to uh, give it a try, go there and download it and figure it out how to install it. Uh, also, I'm running something called JSCast. This is the YouTube channel in which I'm just posting some different uh, information about the Node. And uh, this week, I promised to post information how to launch Node.js on the uh, Docker. Uh, but next week, I will basically uh, do the cast about the admin bro. So if you would like to relieve this event, <laughs> just watch that uh, video. And the last thing is the Twitter channel. So if you would like to have the information about the, our libraries updates, uh, I al always post it there. So you will be up to date. No Instagram on this slide. Uh, Instagram is here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, some crazy photos about our company. Uh, yeah, so this is it. Thank you very much for, for your patience. Okay, guys, a couple of final words. I want to say thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, speakers, for giving their talks. Um, it's, it's really cool that we found community uh, which gathered already two times in Wrocław regarding nodes. It's amazing. Um, we hope to see you next time. If you want to talk about something, please submit talks and we'll be happy to put you here on stage. And Sorry for taking it a little bit longer than we expected, but we hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.